All right, so it's a Perl conference, but being that Perl is the dominant web language of today, <laughs> uh, a lot of JavaScript stuff enters in there. So I wanted to write a talk about that because I see it done a lot. So the inspiration for the title of the talk was back when I worked for a very large e-commerce company, and we did standard code reviews. And one of the developers in my team sent in a code review, and the Perl side of it was really well written and everything was done. And the JavaScript had no indentation. I'm pretty sure it was copy and pasted from at least three different sources. Probably wouldn't work in any browser across every path that it needed to go down. I just rejected it with one line, JavaScript is code too. And it became somewhat of a, uh, a popular response at that point, because everybody thought that was really funny. And really what it's about is people want to do stupid things on the internet. And it's because projects get more complicated, people want them to do more things, and they... My slide transitions aren't bad. And really somebody says, well, I saw this on another website, and I want it to, to do what I just saw. I want it to pop. And they don't really know what it means, but hey, we're developers, we can figure it out, and so we Google. And we go, oh, popping, that's a dialogue. So jQuery is always going to be the default here because you can copy and paste a single line, <coughs> and it does it, it pops, and people get very excited and like, hey, look at what I just did. But then they want something that's a little bit more. And they go, okay, there's something else that jQuery can do, and it's really good. And your page grows and it continues to grow, and it continues to grow, and eventually you have this page that you can't make any sense out of. There's just tags, and there's little JavaScript populated throughout the page, it's copy and pasted, it. and it gets very hard. And eventually you're like, I have to edit that page again? I don't wanna do that. that no. And you start to push back against when people say, I want this to animate or something else that may actually be a good idea, something that'll help the user out. And now you're looking at your page and you're like, I don't want to do that. And so you start to hate. But more importantly, and this is where it starts to matter, it really sucks for your users. If you run the pages through any of the page profilers, you're going to see a lot of important things. So <coughs> combining images, that's a big one, and people don't really do that very often. Every time you load a, a single image, that's the web browser having to make a request to the server and the server responding. There's Keep Alive to make that a little bit faster, but a lot of people don't understand that Keep Alive isn't implemented consistently across all the browsers. IE, for example, will have different numbers of requests per Keep Alive socket, and it'll continue to open. Sometimes you can do stuff in parallel, and they're not combining static resources. Um, the other one is people really don't seem to understand browser caching, especially how it pertains to JavaScript and how JavaScript interacts with the browser. They go, okay, this is going to be Ajax, but right now, PJAX, who here knows what PJAX is? Who's... All right, all the people who I've told. <laughs> I knew it before you told me. Did you? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so what PJAX is, is it leverages some of the new HTML5 stuff and the AJAX, the asynchronous XML, uh, and it loads partial content with a selector. So you can have your server return a page, but then your PJAX library, whether it's jQuery or YUF3 or just a standalone one, can replace certain components. And it uses push states, so the URL updates and only a single container on the page actually changes. Anybody who uses GitHub right now is using PJAX. So when you click on file and it slides in from the side, and you're like, that's a cool effect. That's using PJAX to do that. It loads it from the browser. The problem is browsers have bugs where they cache responses. So if you load an entire page uh, through the browser and then you call that through a PJAX request, pretty much every browser right now will return the same response, even if the, the E tag is different. So there's a lot of bugs that happen with browser caching. So you have to learn, you have to study it. And if you don't do that, your page is going to be slow and or broken. Some of the medium priority stuff, which to me is actually a lot bigger because this is just one little token. It goes, oh, I detected that 
somewhere in the body of the page, you've sprinkled in some JavaScript. You've gone, okay, I'm going to put some jQuery here and over here. And uh, what, what that's doing is it's actually blocking how the, the browser can render the page. So every time you do that, there's a little bit of a penalty. It's a performance penalty. And if you do it a lot, it's a much larger performance penalty than what the median <coughs> priority would actually imply. And then the final really, really big one is the same thing. When you sprinkle this stuff around, you're making the browser stop to parse it, and that's um, their speed bumps. So if you defer all of that to the very end of the page, then it works. If you don't do that, you get kind of annoyed by it. And your users get really, really annoyed by it. Because you can buy faster servers to make your backend application go faster. You can buy yourself a faster workstation so that you can debug it faster. But your users will still hate you because you're not going to send them new computers. So don't do that. There's a couple options that are out there. One is uh, fairly popular for PyJS. It's completely agnostic. It doesn't care if you use jQuery. It doesn't care what you use. You can just load it up, do everything you want. But really, what you're going to want to do is use some sort of a framework to organize what you're doing. So there's Backbone, there's Underscore. You guys don't have to write this down, because I'm going to say that it all sucks in a minute. There's Backbone and Underscore, which gives you kind of some structure to what you're doing. Um, very similar to MVC stuff. So if you guys are doing any Catalyst work or some other MVC framework, it'll feel somewhat similar to that, because it organizes your code into nice little modules. Or you could do something better and just use a framework that does it all for you. And it has some of the smartest people working on it. Uh, Douglas Crocker is, is a brilliant and, and mean man. Uh, who here knows what Jason is? Thank Douglas Crocker for it. Uh, J.S. Lint, same thing. He's the guy behind that. And he's the driving force behind YUI3 uh, from the architecture and everything like that. It has a wonderful foundation behind it. And the, the widget, the UI support, is a little bit lacking in there. But what it's competing with is this require JS and backbone loading everything and really trying to make it so that it's easier to do the right thing than it is to do the wrong thing which I think is pretty damn good. And it's a good goal for them to say, we are making a toolkit that tries to force you to do it the right way because it's easy to do it the right way. And that makes me feel really, really good. And a lot of times I lose that, that option to pick and I have to use something else. And I don't like that. Because every time I use jQuery, I get really frustrated because the APIs aren't consistent. And it's, it's not consistent. Not jQuery core. I actually like jQuery core. I think they actually did a pretty good job of it. jQuery, like jQuery.js. Once you get into UI, it starts to fall down a little bit. Then you get into plugins, and plugins have different APIs, even when they're written by the same people. I'm like, oh, I use something that that guy wrote. I remember like his name. I'm going to check out this other plugin. And he just decided that now he wants to switch over to named parameters where before it was positional. I'm like, why would you do that? Why can't you support mobile? And I spend a lot of time looking at their example pages and then copying and pasting and then tweaking. And as soon as I do that, I'm like, I'm probably doing something bad to my users. And I don't like that feeling. I, I really don't want to, to feel like I'm sacrificing my understanding for speed at getting this project out the door. I want to understand why is something working the way it is. And I can't really do that with jQuery because everything is different. And I don't mean jQuery in the same way, because I think that JavaScript is like Perl, and you have Moose, which is kind of like YUI3. And jQuery is just very scattered. It, it doesn't really have a cohesive ecosystem to it. And YUI3 does. That's what I really like about it. And I think of YUI3 like I think about Moose, that I would rather not program at all than use Perl without Moose. That, that doesn't make any sense to me. And YUI3 has a lot of that same stuff. It has attributes, and you can have lazy loading and deferred uh, uh, loading of, or that's the same thing, really, um, uh, static uh, runtime values that come in. And they're actually putting in a trait system 
uh, into it so that you can specify traits on your attributes. Um, you can chain things. It actually takes the insanity of the JavaScript object system, the, the prototypal inheritance model, and it makes it sane. You can actually do things with it that make sense to somebody Won't who... Does it make JavaScript slow then? No, it's not like Moose. You haven't even seen these slides. No, I haven't. I'm just going, I'm just going with the troll. Rolling right. I appreciate that. And these benchmarks that they do, they take as a top priority. So if something is slow and it, it gets picked up like that, and they actually have unit tests for speed and performance, if something comes up like that, there's an internal effort inside of Yahoo to make it faster because this is powering Yahoo Search, Yahoo Mail, everything like that. There's a lot of people who have slow computers who use Yahoo. Because seriously, why else would you do it? <laughs> but that's what you want. You want to go down to the people who have the 486s who didn't get the math coprocessors using this because that's going to be the slowest thing. So normal people are going to be blown away by the speed. It's going to be amazing. But wait, there's more. <laughs> YUI3 also has an analog to the CPAN. It's called the YUI3 Gallery. They host it on their CDN, so you don't need to download or put anything on your server unless it's going to be on HTTPS. So YUI3 Gallery, you have to uh, submit a uh, contributor agreement to them that says that you have the rights to, to put open source software into the ecosystem. But then after that, it's just managed by Git. You submit a Git pull to them. So instead of a CPAN upload, you submit a pull request. And your module then is on their CDN and available and everything like that, which is great. So the uh, some of the really cool stuff that's, that's taken place on the gallery comes from other companies that are using this. But more importantly, if somebody finds a bug in some core part of YUI3, they can put in a gallery module that fixes it before it can get incorporated into the main, the upstream core YUI3. So the example is uh, the, the next version of YUI3, which is going to be 3.5.0, has a new data table implementation that the benchmarks show that the speed difference between that implementation and any other data table that has been done can't even be compared. It's uh, mind-blowingly fast. And it still has all of the same features. So it's running the same unit test for everything, but he missed the cutoff for it uh, for the pre-release. But he just had to upload the same code into a YUI3 gallery module, and then everybody who wants to opt into that new data table just has to change one little line going from data table to uh, like gallery data table preview, I think is what it was. And they get this new, wonderful, amazing <coughs> data table. And again, it's all hosted for you. You don't have to do anything. It has a combo loader. So all of those defer loading of JavaScript until the right point and don't sprinkle inline stuff, that's taken care of for you by the YMI3 loader. It just says, okay, here you go. I will load everything for you. You tell it in a use line what I'm going to use, and it fetches everything and rolls it up into a uh, combined file. And part of the way that it does that is that it actually can build out the files. And JavaScript's interpreted. You don't need to build it, but what it does is it gives you different versions of the file. So you get a minified version, you get a standalone, like things have been trimmed out that aren't necessary, and then you have a debug, which is exactly how it exists in the repository. And you just filter it. So while you're saying, use my module, you can also say, filter debug. And you get the debug version of your module and everything else. So you can easily fix problems that are there. And that's what the build step provides to you. So it's uh, the way that you put stuff onto the CDN is you build it, but while you're developing it, you can just point it to the raw file and it works. And then that gives you packaging. So you can have your JavaScript files in a package with unit tests and examples by following their model, and it works. And this gives something that we haven't really had in JavaScript for a really long time. And <laughs> so the... Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> so the, uh, the packaging goes a long way to, to closing that gap. When you're actually testing for releases, it still is a little bit rough. It's not all sunshine and unicorns, but it helps because it's kind of annoying to go, 
build, reload the browser, run the unit test. Damn it, something failed. But the build step actually runs JSLint on it, so it detects problems that will bite you. Uh, the big one is trailing commas, i.e. will choke on it. According to the spec, they're correct in that. The other browsers that allow you to have a trailing comma in a data structure, they are wrong. JSLint will pick that stuff up. I'm terrible at it. Perl allows it. You can just say, uh, declare a hash, foo, fat comma, bar, comma, and then close the hash. Nobody cares. Well, JavaScript cares. But going, but it's correct. It's to the spec. And so JSLint picks it up and it, it corrects my mistakes. And JSLint is very, very, very opinionated. Can you guys see the text? No. So this is Douglas Crockford. The JSLint repository is on GitHub. Uh, GitHub.com slash Douglas Crockford slash JSLint. I encourage everybody who has an interest in JavaScript to, to go through the closed bugs and just read some of them. There are people who contribute pages of examples of their JavaScript, what they expect, what they actually got, and he closes the bug with something like this. Because JSLint will tell you very explicitly why you are stupid. But people don't like to hear that, and so they argue with it, and they're like, but it's a bug, because I want to write code this way. <laughs> and he is the master of one-line close statements. They're brilliant. But YUI3 is not exactly the same as Perl. Partially because Douglas Crockford doesn't really have an analog in any language that I've found. I wish I had aviator sunglasses that I could put on right now, so imagine that I actually was motivated yeah, enough. Was close. close enough, so. That was what I was going to do. I was going to put on the programmer sunglasses right at this point, but I wasn't actually going to go buy a pair of sunglasses for you. I thought about it. I had to get a haircut before that. If there was a way that I could have just magically made one up here, I would have. Um, JavaScript is very trendy right now. And I don't mean YUI 3, because that still isn't very trendy. So that's actually like Perl. But JavaScript at the core has, <laughs> has a, uh, a pretty good and trendy following um, that may or may not be a good thing. Uh, you go to JSConf or any like the, the Ruby cons, and there's a lot of tracks that are talking about things you can do with JavaScript or prototype or How jQuery. Apply Axe body spray. What? How to apply Axe body spray properly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of surprising to actually see that because I wrote my first really big JavaScript based application in 2004. And it was, it was this amazing feat of technology. And everybody that was on the business side who saw this said, why didn't you just use Flash? And I had to really defend the decision for it, especially because what it was doing was generating a Flash object at the end. Um, but they, they wanted us to use Flash. And we said, well, no, this, this is the future. We're, we're future-proofing your application. Well, Adobe just dropped Flash, so I was right. Um, I, I didn't have that job for long. Um, Eight years too early, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Eight years it worked in IE6, though. I mean, it worked across the board. They brought in other developers, and they couldn't really make much sense out of it. But the guy who did the brunt of the, the work there, he, uh, he actually works for the YUI team now. Uh, he got recruited by Yahoo. It was funny. He called me up, and he goes, well, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. Well, Yahoo has seen the work that I've produced, and, and they want me to come work for them on the next generation for YUI 3. And I was like, get the fuck out. Why would you stay here? I mean, you just <laughs> saw what we went through defending this. So go in there and go create the future, and he has. And I'm very happy with that. So, because Not I worked with him. What? Not literally did you do it all. <laughs> I wouldn't have taken it. I would have had to move back to the Bay Area. He's been slumming it ever since. Yeah, sure he has. It, it was a path to you. <laughs> Point exactly. The uh, so because I, I have a personal relationship with somebody who's inside of the team, uh, I was I've been able to hear a lot of these stories about how they work and everything, and I've been really impressed with how they how they move forward with the design decisions. Because when you're building a framework, uh, whether it's YUI three or something like Moose, there's a lot of opinions that get interjected, and a lot of times, if people's opinions aren't heard, 
they start to drop letters off, and so there, there's moo and mo and, and things like that. But that didn't really happen. Everybody was like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll make this work. And they were very happy about that. Nobody went off and said, well, I, I'm, I'm going to make this new version of YUI, YUI 3, because YUI 2 is stale. Nobody wants to use it anymore. But now, everybody still is on board. Everybody's like, okay, YUI 3 is the best. YUI 2 can get buried now. And everybody went. And Douglas Crockford said, that's wonderful. This is a, uh, another bug that he closed. I want to say that it was at least two pages in the browser where this guy was explaining uh, the bad results that he encountered. And it was closed with, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> My software was that good. Um, so YUI3 still does have some problems to it. Uh, they're kind of minor. You're, you're at Yahoo's mercy. Hey, Steven. Sorry. I don't heckle in your talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, you should. it is controlled by Yahoo, Yahoo Corporation, which is not really a, a, a center of innovation. I don't think anybody would go, well, Yahoo leads the way in that's really right. anything, except for NYUI3, and that's because they happen to have a, a group of about 12 really talented developers that are working towards a common goal and funded by a company that I don't even know if they really know they exist. And... Uh, they may think that they're janitors and wondering why their, their salaries are so high. Um, so there's somewhat of an us versus them. Either you work for Yahoo and, and you get to look behind the curtain or you don't. And so there's sort of this walled garden mentality. And, and you can get access into it, but you're always a visitor. You're always a guest. Um, but since YY3 came out, it's always been on GitHub. So you can always check out all of the source. Uh, Yahoo maintains their own Git repository and they sync it back and forth uh, because some modules that they have are propri proprietary into, uh, into what Yahoo needs to do. Like Yahoo Mail has a bunch of stuff that they'll never release because it is specific to what they do. Um, but they use their gallery for it. So they're actually dog fooding everything. So they have their own little CPAN layer sort of for adding all of this stuff on top of it. We just don't get to see it, but we get to have all of the benefits for it. Um, the other downside is that there is only one. Um, if Yahoo blew up, if their data centers started to blink out of existence, the CDN would go away. They use their same CDN for all of their products, so that shouldn't happen. Now, having said that, in the last two years, I can think of at least three, not outages, but where it took 30 seconds to get a response, which sucks, but it's the internet and things suck on the internet still. Um, the other one is that there's no secure CDN. One of their uh, engineers, uh, in defense of this, went on this like <coughs> rampage and proceeded to explain why you don't want to do that. So I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to summarize because it was a lot of reading. Every time you're loading something by a HTTPS, you are confirming your identity. You're saying that my website is mine and you should trust me because I paid money to some faceless organization that said that, yes, somebody gave me money to say that they were this person. But you have a contract with your users that's based off of this trust that everything is secure and they're only sharing their data with that website. And that's what they assume, but as soon as you load something from a third party provider, whether it's via SSL or not, you're granting them access to it. So if somebody managed to get a gallery module with some sort of malicious code inserted into it that picked up on whether or not people have credit card numbers on the page, well, now you've just violated your user's trust because of that. Now, it's not really a good argument because really, if you want to have this stuff on a uh, HPS server, you would just take the same code and post it. You're not going to actually audit all of the code because nobody does that. I mean, who here has read all of Moose's source code? You guys don't count. <laughs> now, um, so it, the argument is very good in theory, but in practice, it's really just annoying because you're like, I want to just have SSL. Yeah. What is what is the, is the concern? If you're on a if you're on an SSL page and you 
load this, you get the sort of mixed, mixed load warning? Yeah. Well, that's if you don't use SSL. Um, if, if you have an HTTPS server and you're loading JavaScript from a third party that you don't control, you're granting them access to everything. So it's basically inviting another party into the bedroom to watch. Right. And but the end, the end user is the end user. The end user complaint is I get warnings about mixed security. Level. Oh no, they, that would never happen. Uh, the, if you do it where everything is under SSL, the user will never have any indication that that's actually happening because everything is going to be secured and encrypted. The problem is, is that that third party now has access to the conversation. For the and it's specifically to the DOM via JavaScript, so if there's a credit card number on the page, your YUI module can use JavaScript to scrape right. through the page, find the credit card, and like... So, uh, so maybe I'm just confused. Is this complaint is that Yahoo doesn't serve up right. YUI 3 through... Through, a, through SSL because of that. Now, so jQuery... To prevent caching, that seems to be the big issue. The, well, the, so the Google CDN has, uh, like, jQuery. So let's just say in a hypothetical example, that somebody managed to insert malicious code into the jQuery code base that gets uploaded onto the Google CDN. It's available via SSL. So somebody comes up with their awesome order form with JavaScript, and they write something to verify credit card numbers uh, in there. So they put in their little loan check, and this malicious code hooks into any form submit on the page looking for something that slightly resembles a credit card and then does a secure post to their server in Romania to get all the credit card numbers. Your user will never know. And unless you're auditing all the code, you will never know. But Google, by providing this under SSL, took the burden of responsibility away from the developer to consciously make that choice. You should have to consciously decide, I am using third-party code in what is supposed to be a trusted and secure conversation with a user. And without consciously making that decision, you're violating the trust that, that you have when you have that little lock symbol and the HTTPS. So, it's a theoretical debate. Uh, in practice, everybody uses code from other people and never audits it and all of that, but the, the stance from Yahoo is that that should be a deliberate decision that you make and then the, the decision to do that rests with you as a service provider. So you have to write, uh, or you have to implement a combo loader on your own and put that behind SSL. But hey, it's cool because YUI3 lets you do that very, very easily. And I actually wrote a uh, combo loader as a plaque middleware. It works very simple. You point it at a directory, and it works. It gives you all of the, the YUI3 combo files, just and so it understands how to combine files, basically, uh, query parameters. Require.js and the YUI3 loader have very similar models, so it should actually work with uh, Require.js. I've not tested that, so if you do and it doesn't work, let me know, and we'll figure out how to make it. Or you could just use YUI3. Um, the, the way that the loading works in YUI3 is, is really solid because it has dependency trees. Um, there's actually a server-side uh, loader module that's being written in Node um, that attempts to parse each page that you have uh, so as it sees a new page, it actually will compute and then cache the response. So when it serves up the page, it goes, oh, you're asking for this page. I have already figured this out for you. So there's no uh, runtime resolution of dependencies. Because right now, if you do runtime resolution of dependencies and module A depends on B, depends on C, it's a very long chain to finally figure out. And uh, that can get slow. So if you do it right and you follow the guides, it is very, very fast. Uh, usually you're looking at one request for JavaScript, one request for CSS, and you're done uh -huh, for the uh, combo loading. Uh, so when you start to use this stuff and it works, and you use what's the, the rough equivalent of a make file to say this is what depends on everything and it wires up, you're really left going, wow, how did I ever do this stuff before that because it's just really easy and you can trace the dependency tree and everything like that. Um, it still is somewhat young. All of this stuff is fairly new to the world um, and it's worth going and looking at the different options. Uh, and the YUI3 loader has a really, really good talk that was done at the last YUI conf uh, 
which has probably more people than OPW, just as far as the scale goes. Um, so you guys should write that URL down because it's really good. I'm just messing with you guys. Um, so that's a URL to watch. Um, it goes pretty quick. Uh, do you guys know what Mebo is? Heard of Mebo? The like instant messaging in the browser type thing. They use YUI3. Uh, they're probably one of the most advanced users of it because I'm pretty sure their engineers are bored. Uh, so they just do a lot of weird things, but they've produced a lot of <coughs> talks and documentation on how they've managed to stretch the, the principles of loading as far as they can go to have very, very good uh, experiences based on if you're using a mobile device or a browser. Um, so it actually does uh, feature detection <coughs> and loads different things based off of that. So uh, I figured that you guys should have some questions. Uh, so I'm ending the talk with a few minutes earlier than I intended, but that's YUI3, combo, uh, combo loader, plaque middleware combo loader, give it a look, give YUI3 a look, and I have time for questions if anybody wants to. What's the license of uh, YUI3? BSD. Yep. Do you have any recommendations for best ways to learn it? So there's a million jQuery books out there. Um, there's one that's actually in uh, in the pipeline. It's in the final stages of review that's going to come out. Uh, if you go to yuilibrary.com, which I probably should have put that up there, like go to yuilibrary.com. Um, they have guides for going through everything. Uh, you should be amazed by the documentation. Um, after you figure out how to navigate through the site, you will go. Wow, this is a an amazing trove of documentation. Um, Yahoo Corp actually takes that very seriously. Um, it's kind of been a mandate that stuff has to be documented before it's actually marked for release. So, like the the new PJX component came out in the pre-release for their next version, but it doesn't have documentation. That will get scuttled from the release if it's not adequately documented. Um, so they'll block features from being released if there's not documentation for it. Yes. There's also the, uh, the Rosetta Stone for jQuery. Yeah, you can go to jsrosettastone.com. Uh, I think it's .com. Or you can just Google for JS Rosetta Stone, and it gives you a list of here's the jQuery syntax, and then here's how you would do the comparable thing in uh, <coughs> YY3. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that YY3 does more uh, progressive feature rollups on it. So if you want to use CSS3 selectors in your targeting IE6, you can just say, well, I want to use that um, because that's a pure JavaScript implementation of the, uh, the DOM query. And that's a lot of heft to do that. So you actually have to specifically say, I want this feature. Um, and if you're doing anything more than, um, like, I want all divs with this class name, then you want to use that. Uh, but it's also smart enough that it won't load it if, uh, and this is going into the feature detection. It doesn't really load anything if the browser supports it. So that's it tries to be very smart with it. Is there a standard like default test structure? Like let's say you create a new YUI library thing. Is it like this is the standard canonical way of writing a test suite for YUI yeah. plugin? The uh, it, you can find that on the site pretty easily. So, like, so there's like a standard file name somewhere that it's. You know, like well, it's kind of like, like in the uh, world. We always, this is like a standard. Like you always know where to look for the tests. Right. Uh, yeah, it's just in the test directory. Okay. So you have the test directory, and then you can just run through there, and they have um, automated manual tests cool. that go through it. Um, the the test harness and the test framework that they have is is pretty well developed. Um, the uh, the one thing that annoys me is that because the gallery module, like I said, is just a pull request, uh, they don't want to, to fill that up with a bunch of crap because if you're running your own uh, Yahoo CDN, you have to pull that stuff down. So they say, okay, well, don't push your tests into the main line. So you actually have to have like a fork of your own that has the tests, and then when you merge it in, you remove the tests, and right. that gets a little bit goofy because uh, they just want to trim that down. Uh, and the tests are optional for the gallery modules. Because there's some stuff that requires so much user interaction that you can't easily test it. Um,
Yes. You talked about the proprietary modules that Yahoo has in their own gallery. Um, and those are not open source. Are those commonly in use by a third party, or is it pretty much just Yahoo that uses those? Uh, for that stuff, that's that's only Yahoo. Like nobody Yahoo. sees that. Um, the the YUI three gallery that's public that. You have to sign the contributor license because anything that you release has the same license, um, the BSD license. Uh, that stuff is in use in quite a few different places. Um, the so there's a company called LifeRay, and they actually have an entire toolkit that's uh, built on top of YUI, and it's called Alloy UI. But all of their stuff is actually in the gallery. So they sell this toolkit for building applications or some other craziness, but all of their their individual components are open source and on the gallery. So that's pretty cool that you can see that type of sharing. Yeah. So there's no risk that if Yahoo <coughs> just belly up, not that that could ever happen to a big company like that, that, that this stuff is not available to you anymore. The stuff uh, that you're using is always available. Yeah. We uh, we run a completely detached, like, custom gallery with our stuff that hasn't been released and a version of YUI, and it's all on the BSD license. So, uh, Scott Thompson was just put in as their CEO, and he's from PayPal, so he's probably very evil. And if he decides, hey, these janitors get paid too much money and we don't need JavaScript, let's just use Flash, um, the, the code would still exist. I'm pretty sure that most of the core people there would continue to, to put in a lot of work on They've actually experienced a lot of people who use that, like Mebo, uh, to call them out specifically. Uh, where they're like, hey, we use YUI a lot. We should hire some of these core guys. Hey, come work for us. And then they don't get as much time to commit, uh, which is a shame, but that happens. Good thing nobody uses Perl, otherwise Steven would be pulled away. So just to clarify, mm -hmm. YUI is a JS library. Yep. It's not Perl bindings to the JS library. Nope. The uh, they they're completely separate. The uh, if you use Moose and you use that type of Perl uh -huh. going into YUI three when you're creating the class, you'll go like, oh, here's how I define my attributes. Instead of doing like has blah, you'll know the syntax of it. But it, it feels very comfortable and similar. And it also has roles and. Uh, like a normal inheritance model. So you can extend the class um, in largely the same way that you would with Moose, and then you can also apply traits to it. Which is another good talk, but it confuses me, because JavaScript, I, I'm, I'm not really a programmer. <laughs> That's what I, whenever I, I read or watch anything about that, I'm like, I just put things together. It needs to come in like a Lego box. <laughs> All right, then. My 40 minutes are up in 60 seconds, and I'm at home. All right. <clears throat> Thanks,